Fanny is a, um, a, a researcher at um, <coughs> Cape Peninsula University of Technology. He, um, he, he's a biochemist and yes. his, um, his, uh, his field of research is, um, is rooibos tea. And uh, he works out why rooibos tea is, uh, is a healthy tea to drink. I think, I don't know whether that, that uh, totally misinforms us of what you do for your research, but that's no, what, I, what I, uh, I understand. So, um, so that's a real, uh, a real practical uh, research topic. So finally also um, heads up the um, identification team for the, uh, for the butterflies. I meant to have a look up and check how many butterflies you had ID'd, funny, but I failed to do so, but it's an enormous number of butterflies. It's in the tens of thousands. So uh, we deeply, deeply appreciate. Do you know what the number is, Fonny? Uh, it's over 100,000 now. Over 100,000, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> we bow down worship in awe of, uh, of that. Thank you, Fonny, for your incredible contribution. So you can upload a butterfly and um, within a few hours, Fani has, um, has, has attached an identification to it. It's just amazing, the Virtual Museum Lepi map. So Fani is going to be telling us about uh, some aspects of the Lepi map project this evening. So Fani, over to you. Thanks, Les. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the Lepi map challenge. It was something that we started uh, six months ago. Uh, it was in September of last year that uh, I gave my first presentation. And uh, at that point, um, the Lippi Map Challenge is specifically for South Africa, Lesotho and Eswatini. Um, at that point in September uh, of 2020, the identified photo records for butterflies on the Lippi Map for those three countries uh, stood at uh, 123,000. And uh, that has improved now to 132,000 at the end of March 2021. Um, the main idea behind the Lepi Map Challenge was that even though we have so many records, photo records for the butterflies in these three countries, is that surprisingly, we still have no photos for 112 species. So in South Africa, we have just over 800 species that includes the, the subspecies. And we have not received any photos uh, for 112 species, which is quite surprising since uh, LepiMap has been ongoing since 2007. So that's uh, almost uh, 14 years, more than 14 years now. And we've received over 100,000 photos, and yet there's no photos for 112 species. Now, since uh, my presentation in September, uh, that has improved slightly. So by the end of March uh, 2021, we now only have 108. So we've received photos for four of the species for which we have never had a photo before. So I'll preview uh, a few of those. Uh, so this one is known as the Wineland Blue Giant Cupid. Um, I actually featured it in my presentation uh, in September last year. Uh, Steve Woodall, uh, the, uh, the, uh, one of the uh, known uh, lepidopterists here in South Africa, actually helped me out. He knew this guy called Paul Martin. Uh, and he knew Paul Martin had photos of, of this species. And uh, Paul Martin then submitted this record. The record, unfortunately, is still a bit old. It was, he took the, or he collected the specimen in November 2012. Uh, so although we now do have a photo, uh, unfortunately, the record is a bit old. And interestingly, um, this record came from the PE area. Uh, there's an industrial area called the Kuga Industrial Area. And this is where there's a known colony of the Wineland Blue Giant Cupids. And in November last year, I actually sent some people, uh, because Paul then could tell me exactly where to find the species, I, I sent some of the Lepi Map contributors who left, you know, who is living there in the PE area, 
uh, to that specific location and unfortunately they could not find it. Um, and then Paul to told me that uh, November 2012 was actually the last time that he also saw them there. So unfortunately, even though we now do have this record, um, it it's appears that they no longer fly in that area, they're in the Kuga industrial area in PE. Uh, uh, and it's probably related to the, the, the rain or a, a bit of a lack of rain and the drought that has plagued that area for the last uh, number of years. But at least we do have a record. Uh, but you can see still here in the Western Cape uh, part of uh, its, its flight area, we still have no records. Uh, that's just the, the, where it, uh, the record was recorded. Uh, the second species is the Kamanasi giant russet. Uh, this photo was taken by Graham Young also in November 2012. Um, the, the giant russets, there's actually a number of subspecies in South Africa. And this was the, I think there's another subspecies for which we don't have any photos for. So of the five subspecies, uh, we now have photos of four of the subspecies. Um, um, and uh, so this was a good record because the Kamanasi uh, giant russet was only known to fly in one area on the Kamanasi mountains near George. And uh, this uh, record is actually a new lo locality which uh, wasn't known before. So, uh, so now we actually have two localities for, for this subspecies. So that's a, a huge improvement uh, from its known existence. Okay, so that's the second one. Uh, this is the third one is known as the nosy cupid. Now I actually made a mistake because when I um, uh, started with the presentation or, or uh, prepared for the presentation, I listed this one that we've never had a photo before, but when I prepared the presentation, I actually discovered that there was a, a much earlier photo of it in 2009. So although this is now not a new uh, or the first photo record for the nosy cupid, uh, it is still a good record because uh, the last, uh, the only other photo we have was from 2009. So uh, to have now another photo record of it, uh, what's it, uh, 12 years later is definitely still something worthwhile. Uh, so this is the nominate species. Uh, the photo was taken, uh, let me just show, this is the distribution map for the nominate species. Uh, this one was the, the old record, which was actually present. Uh, and then this was this particular photo uh, taken there on the southern tip of the Dragonsberg or, or the southern tip of Lesotho, just uh, in uh, the border with South Africa. Uh, and it's a good photo. It's a, uh, these uh, Orochrysop species are quite tough to find, so uh, I'm very pleased uh, that we now have such a beautiful photo of this species. Uh, the fourth species that we now have a photo of is also uh, is the subspecies of Orochrysops nasutus. Uh, is Orochrysop nasutus remus. And we actually had two photo records of this one uh, in February 2021. Uh, so this one was taken by Trish Strachan. Um, and uh, it was this top, uh, the green, uh, little green circle there on the top part. Uh, also on the Drakensberg um, border with uh, Lesotho and South Africa. And then this was the second photo taken by Cornelia Rautenbach. I'm not sure if she's family uh, of mine, uh, not uh, that I'm aware of. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this is also so to have actually two records uh, of the Orochrysop nasutus remus uh, subspecies is actually great. Um, so that's kind of like an update on what has happened in the last six months since my initial uh, presentation. Um, so it it has kind of let me wonder about was this now a success? A success? Is it an improvement? Yes, it is, but it is still a bit disappointing that we still have 108 uh, species that uh, we now uh, still don't have any photos of. 
So it has kind of uh, let me think about what could be the problem. Why are LepiMap contributors, uh, LepiMap citizen scientists, struggling to find certain species? And I want to demonstrate to you uh, the, what the problem is by looking at the distribution of certain species. And I will first start first with the ones that we are having good success with, and then I will show you the ones that we are struggling with. So this is the most common species uh, of butterfly in South Africa, the painted lady, lady. And as you can see, it has a very wide distribution throughout South Africa in every type of uh, climate and habitat that you can find. It will be present. Um, just to remind you that uh, the yellow squares on this map is the non-photo records that's uh, present in the LepiMap database. They are mostly historical records dating back as far ago as 1850. And uh, it was, uh, and it actually goes to about 2007. So uh, almost uh, 160 years worth of historical records. And then the, the little blue circles are the photo records which started in 2007. So those are the records for the last 14 years where citizen scientists has submitted their photo records. And as you can see with the painted lady is that we are actually, in terms of photo records, doing very well. So that's the number of records for the painted lady, the non-DM records, the non-photo records uh, was almost 2000. And we, in the last 14 years, we've received 3,175 photo records. And if you look at the quarter degree squares, it for the non-photo records is 514 and we've improved on that by more than or almost 100 quarter degree squares so so almost a third of south africa's uh, land area as the uh, painted lady being recorded so this is an example of a species where in terms of the lepi map we are doing extremely well here's another example uh, the black-haired bush brown, it has a more confined uh, distribution area. It, it requires a specific habitat, and that's why it's only present in certain parts of South Africa. But again, you can see number of records, 1,800 for non-photo records. And then the photo records is a lot more, 2,500. And then the quarter degree squares are almost exactly the same, uh, the same 167 versus 161. So there are plenty of these type of species where uh, the LEPI map is doing extremely well, where we fare uh, very comparatively well with uh, the old historical records. But then there are other records which doesn't look so good. So this one is known as Southeast Giant Cupid. And you can see it has a very fairly confined uh, distribution in the Eastern Cape and parts of the Free State. And if you look at the records, uh, the historical records are 125, and we haven't had any photo records in the, the 14 year history of the Lepi map. Uh, quarter degree squares, 15 for non photo records, and absolutely zero uh, for the photo records. Uh, the Dark Ranger, it's a little skipper. Um, 261 records for. Uh, the historical records and then only two for uh, the lepi map the photo records and then the quarter degree squares 33 versus two and even those two records uh, the photo records was in the last about two years so uh, uh, so we've been struggling to get photos of the species as well so so that's kind of what i wanted to illustrate is that we are doing well with certain species uh, it's probably the more common species that you can find in South Africa. And then with the more specialized uh, species that require a specific habitat and have a more constrained uh, distribution, uh, we are certainly struggling. So I was thinking in terms of what can we do to, uh, to kind of solve the problem or at least make it easier for LEPI map contributors to, to find these species. And in order to do that, I've kind of looked at my own experiences with trying to find butterflies here in the Western Cape. And what I realized is that I think most Lepi map 
contributors just randomly go to a place and probably just randomly walk around and hope to find butterflies uh, that way and photograph whatever they find. But in order to find the more specialized species, you need uh, to, to kind of consider that it's a bit more complicated and you need to consider more factors involved in trying to find those. So those factors uh, that's required to find the butterfly, I have kind of uh, come down to the following. Number one is you need to realize that specific butterflies require a specific habitat and you need to know what that habitat is in order to find it. Secondly, you need to know that what the host plant of the butterfly is. If you know the host plant, it could uh, definitely assist you to find the butterfly. Because most especially the females are usually around the host plant. And then thirdly, you need to know the flight period of that specific species. What times, uh, what months of the year or weeks of the year, is it in summer or winter or in spring, when does it actually fly? And if you can combine those uh, three things, if you know the habitat that uh, the butterfly prefers, if you know the host plant that it, uh, the female lay the eggs on, and if you know what uh, time of the year it flies, then that will improve your chances of finding that particular species. Now, the thing is, um, even though field guides uh, normally uh, list the host plant, so they will give the Latin names of the host plant, they will definitely tell you when it flies, and they will give descriptions of the habitat. What I think is lacking uh, is that, especially in terms of uh, the host plant, is that most lay people, you know, you're, you're just a run-of-the-mill guy that wants to find butterflies, probably doesn't know uh, the Latin names of plants. Uh, it's definitely something that I struggled with uh, for a long time. I usually have to go and Google uh, the Latin name to see what the plant looks like. So there's no kind of a guide that combines all these three factors, uh, show you the habitat, show you the photos of the food, uh, the host plant, and then tell you in what time of the year they fly. There's no such guide available. So, and that's where I thought that um, I can compile something that will assist the Lippi Map citizen scientists to, uh, to try and find um, a specific species. So, I just want to share uh, something else. So, I've taken one of the species that we don't have a photo for and I've comply, uh, compiled this uh, it's a two-page kind of uh, field guide that will assist you uh, in terms of what to look for and where to find it. So this is the, the Zululand Emperor Swallowtail. It's actually the biggest butterfly in South Africa. Now you will be surprised if I tell you that of the five subspecies that fly in South Africa, we actually don't have a photo on the Lepi map for this one, even though it's the biggest uh, butterfly in South Africa. So that's that's fairly surprising and disappointing that for such a butterfly, we actually don't have um, a, a photo. So I've compiled this and basically what it entails is that on the, if you look at the left hand side, uh, so on in this column, it will show you how the, the butterfly looks like. Uh, and then if I go down, it will show you its distribution. And in this case, it has a very small distribution of only five quarter degree squares uh, in KwaZulu-Natal. And then I have listed the places where you can specifically go and look for it in those five quarter degree squares. So there are five forests in those five quarter degree squares. And it's in those forests that they can fly, that they uh, that species flies. So these are actually linked to the Lepi map. So if you uh, click on it, it will take you to those quarter degree squares in the Lepi map, and you can see all the other species uh, that have been recorded in those quarter degree squares. So so there's the the habitat basically that I'm telling you you must go and look for it. Uh, this is just. Uh, a description of the habitat, uh, uh, it's riverine and Afro-montane forest. 
And then the host plant, if I go back up, I've listed, there are several host plants actually for the species. I've listed the three most prominent ones. And then I've shown photos uh, of the one, which is Cassina anisata. Um, and also you will see that there are links uh, to these host plants. If you click on these links, it will actually take you to other websites, which will give you even more photos of the food plants uh, and even more information, you know, uh, flower colors, when does it fruit, how does the fruit looks like if it does have fruit. Uh, so it gives you more information on the, the food plant. So basically, but I, I wanted this to be important because I wanted people to see how the food plant looks like, because if you walk around in those forests and you recognize this food plant, and you remember, but this is the one for the Zululand uh, emperor, then, uh, then that will help you to find the butterfly because the females uh, will be prominent around the food plant usually. So there's more photos. And then here on the right hand side, the bottom, I have listed the flight period and basically just the larger or the longer the bar is, the better your chances is of finding it uh, during that month. So for this species, kind of like January, February, March is, is the best uh, time to go and look for it, although you will find it in October, November and December as well. Okay, there's a few interesting links which one can also go and have a look at. And then on the second page, I have focused on one of the quarter degree squares. So this is the Nkandla Forest quarter degree square. You can uh, see the Nkandla Forest here at the bottom of uh, this quarter degree square. So this is where you can go and look at it. But I wanted to feature a quarter degree square as well, because uh, like Les always says, is that we need to update the records of all the species in that particular quarter degree square. Uh, and if you look at it, this quarter degree square, it's actually interesting that although they, we have historically have recorded 132 species here, we've only found two moth species uh, in this quarter degree square, which is uh, definitely very surprising. And then of the 132 species that have been recorded here, 29 hasn't been recorded since the year 2000. So, so apart from going to look for the Zululand Emperor, there are loads of other species for which uh, the records can be updated as well. I also list the median date. So that's the last recorded uh, median date, which is 2008. And then the all records median date, which is 1984, which is actually very low. So, so there's lots of records that can be updated and that will improve those dates. Uh, at the bottom, I list recently recorded species. So you can see all of these species was recorded in 2020. So that was just to give people kind of an idea of what they can find in this quarter degree square. And then I also give a list of some of the species that hasn't been recorded since 2008. And you can see some of these records go back to 1969. And, and I mean, a species like uh, the Topaz Babel Blue is a very common species. So uh, it, there's no reason why this date should be 1979. That should be 2021. It's a very common species. Even the False Chief uh, and the Angle Grass Yellow, those are very common species, so these dates can easily be updated. Uh, if there's an endangered species in this quarter degree square, I will also list that. So in this case, there is one, uh, but this one was uh, recent, fairly recently recorded in 2015. Okay, so that was that's my idea. Uh, if if there's interest in something like this, and I've, if people think that they can use this to find uh, the missing species that we don't have photos for, then I'm uh, more than willing to produce uh, one of these on a fairly regular basis and that we can eventually maybe have uh, one such uh, pamphlet or a guide for each of the missing species. And I also want to wanted to make it uh, fairly interactive. I want people to, once they they photograph uh, the butterfly, to also maybe photograph, uh, you know, the uh, where they have photographed it so that we can look how the habitat uh, looks like, uh, you know, whether it's a forest or a marsh or whatever, take a photo, send it back to me, and then I can include and update the list or the, the guide for that specific, uh, specific species. Okay, so that's my story. I uh, don't know if there's uh, any questions on that.
Fantastic. Thank you, Fanny. Um, sorry, everyone, my internet's acting up a bit, so I'm going to try and facilitate without the video just for now. Um, there was a question in the chat saying, do you have any experience with apps for cell phones like um, iNaturalist or Flora Incognita, and could that be precise enough for your work? Uh, for sure. Uh, I think uh, that can definitely work. You know, uh, the photo, I, I, I've struggled to take photos with cell phones. They're not always that great. But if if uh, I can make out, you know, any uh, markings whatsoever, then uh, certainly they can be identified. And if the location, you know, the GPS record uh, is also recorded, then uh, surely that can definitely work. Great. Thanks. There was one question in Facebook as well. Um, from Tony asking, um, what happens to iNaturalist records of butterflies? Are they incorporated into the statistics? Uh, and at the moment, we... yes, at the moment, uh, there's no data uh, sharing between iNaturalist and the LEPI map, which is, I guess, uh, you know, that's probably something that needs to be looked at. You know, there's also other databases like uh, LEPSOC also has. Uh, a database where LEPSOC members submit their records and, and that was actually why the, the historical records were only updated to 2007. Since then, those LEPSOC uh, records from 2007 to 2021 hasn't been incorporated. So there's definitely, there's lots of databases that I think should be incorporated and shared because that will also, uh, you know, uh, certainly show us that there are photos maybe of all these missing species so so that's a problem the the data that i have is based on the data that's in the lepi map not what is in iNaturalist and not what is in other databases and that certainly is uh, is a problem right great thanks okay there's a few more questions still coming into the chat um laban is asking outside of presentations like this how else can citizen scientists to get this kind of information? Um, is it available in the virtual museum? Laban, did you want to specify? Yeah, he, you, you've told us uh, information about where to get uh, like the specialized species, you know, yes. like the habitat, you know, the time of flight yes. and uh, so on. So outside of a presentation like this, yes. if uh, somebody wanted to know this kind of information, is there a place they can get it? Well, that is, uh, that is the one thing I still needed to discuss with Les. We haven't uh, had time to come together, but this little guide that I've shown you, I, I actually want to email it to people or maybe put it on a website somewhere. I know uh, there's something similar, Les, on the BDI website for dragonflies and damselflies, so maybe we can post it on the BDI yeah. website as well. So, but I certainly, I want to distribute this to as many people as possible. The more people that can see this guide and it, if it can help them to find the species, then, you know, the better for me. So, uh, so it's definitely, I do want to distribute this. So we must just figure it out still less how we're going to do that. Okay, great. There's um, a couple more questions here. David is asking for species like the Dark Ranger, where there are far fewer virtual museum records um, than historical records. Is that just because they're disappearing or because they're not being recorded? Um, I th it's like I said, I think they are very specialized habitat species, you know, and I think Lepi Map uh, citizen scientists are struggling to find it. That specific one flies in a very specific type of grass. And if you don't know that it flies in that grass, you will never find it. It's a, it's a weird little story. There's, a, there's another subspecies that actually flies uh, here fairly close to Cape Town. And uh, it took us, uh, me and uh, somebody else, years to actually try to figure out in what type of grass it flies and to eventually find it. And once we did, we actually started finding other localities because we knew what grass to look for. So, but it, your other, the other part of your, uh, what you are saying is also true because they might also be disappearing. But that's why I want people to go to know where to look for them so that we can see whether they are still present in those areas where they have been uh, recorded historically. We need to update those records. If they are not there anymore, so be it, then we know they're not there. But if people don't know what to look for and where to look for, then we'll never know. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Fanny. 